This is just a sample of the audiobook. To get the complete audiobook access the link posted in the first comment. Chapter 1 Until July 1938 This village of Auburn might be so complacently picturesque, if it weren't for the shop which Albert and his father built of public washroom brick, slap in the middle of the square, that we owe the two of them a debt of gratitude, if only for that alone. The building brings the whole place down to earth, sobers it up, and takes it out of fancy dress, so to speak. Albert still maintains that it is a lovely shop. He and his father have always liked it. In fact, they built it twice, with their own hands. They had just got it up once, in all its nakedness, directly in front of one of the only two genuine maypoles in England, when the council came along and wanted the road wider. So Albert and his father pulled the shop down again, all two stories of it, carefully brick by brick, and set it up again once more, fifteen feet or so further back, where it stands, at least at the time of writing, a visible sign that the village is not an old-fashioned musical comedy backcloth. The maypole is not used as a maypole now, of course. There is nothing arty about the place, which is still agricultural. The pole, which is only a pole, has a weathercock on top of it, and at its foot, where one waits for the bus, grow two may trees, one red and one white, which the old doctor and Mrs. Graves put there forty years ago, when they were the uncrowned kings of the village. Behind the maypole is Norrie's Forge, which has not been altered in the last hundred years at least, and which looks like one of those very neat and restrained advertisement plates in big American magazines, the kind beneath which the copy begins, In olden days, fine craftsmen worked under difficulties. You never saw such ordered clutteredness, and when the fire is in full blast, and he and his second eldest brother, Jack, the Mycroft of the family, are at work there, in their goatskin aprons, clinking and clanking on the largest anvil, which rings like a fire-bell all over the village, the effect, if they will forgive me for saying so, is quite extraordinarily reminiscent of the diamond mine scene in Snow White. This is especially true on a dark and windy autumn day, when the black clouds pile up over the low roof of red pantiles, and there seems to be no horizon. Reggie's grocer's shop, the Auburn Stores, is in the square too, and so is the Queen's Head, which stands back in its own yard with a great sign swinging on a rather nice post, which the brewers have put up. The post office is next to the Queen's, and it does look a little as if it had come off a toffee tin. It has bow windows with small panes, one of which has been taken out to let in a red tin letterbox, and at one time it must have been a very important shop. Auburn is perhaps a little like that. Not degenerate or decaying, but retired. Most of the medium-sized houses used to be shops, in the days when ten miles to town meant ten miles on foot or astride. Norrie says that when he was a little old boy, the man who had Reggie's shop had five assistants, each with a clean white tablecloth apron every Monday morning, and it was Ford one, please, and two are you serving? Which sounds mightily impressive and considering the size of the building, astonishing. As well as the Queen's, there are two other pubs, which is plenty, since there are only six hundred odd of us, counting the outlying farms, and a large percentage of the population is elderly and stays at home. One of these inns, the Thatchers, is kept by Norrie's brother Jack, and their two sisters, Miss Vic and Miss Susie, and there they've got the ham in the glass.